Welcome back to another edition of Standing on the Shoulder of Giants. This week we'll be looking at mapping the stars with all sky surveys. Many of us might think of the stars as unchanging. From night to night we see the same constellations, invariable in appearance and shifting predictably in the sky thanks to the rotation and revolution of the Earth. However, we know by now there are all sorts of changes happening, from the motion of tiny asteroids and the subtle variations of Cepheid stars to the brief but brilliant flare of a supernova. How do we study and track these kinds of changes? It seems inefficient to observe the same patch of sky again and again and again, waiting for something to happen. It would make more sense to search large patches of the sky, but how do we know where to start? And how do we know that something we see on one night wasn't there the night before? To do this properly, astronomers need to explore a different method of observing, one that often involves more of the patience of a cartographer and record keeping than the excitement of a serendipitous discovery. We need surveys and detailed catalogues of the whole night sky. How do we do this? What's the best approach and what are the limitations and how have our techniques for mapping the sky evolved over the years? Today it can be easy to take for granted that we have a map of the night sky available at our fingertips. You might have a star atlas on your bookshelf or a stargazing app on your smartphone or you might simply turn to the internet in search of a specific database. But how did these maps come about? There are an immense number of variables involved when an astronomer decides that they want to conduct a survey of the night sky. First, what sky is the astronomer looking at? A map of the constellations made in California will look very different from a map of the constellations made in Chile. Second, just how deep should the survey map go? Our eyes alone show us countless stars when in a dark location, but just add binoculars and an entirely new host of dimmer stars immediately appear. This effect is further pronounced when we shift to bigger and bigger telescopes. How faint should stars be before a map of the sky is considered complete? And what about wavelength? We've learned about the astronomical research that spans the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Do we want to survey the stars in visible light, the same light we detect with our eyes? Other astronomers might prefer a radio survey or an X-ray survey, each carrying their own technical challenges. There are a number of other questions that need to be addressed, but one thing is clear, no one survey will be perfect or truly complete. Still, knowing the stars and knowing them well is a crucial first step to studying how they work and eventually how they will change. Astronomers have shown this for millennia. Polynesian navigators had an encyclopedic knowledge of the stars, recognising precisely where they should rise and set as a function of time and location, and naming hundreds of stars and astrophysical phenomena. This knowledge was passed down through training and oral traditions, and the navigators' mental charts and naked eye measurements were so accurate that the Polynesians are widely recognised today as being among the greatest and most far-reaching explorers in history. In Australia, Aboriginal astronomers similarly passed down their detailed knowledge of the sky through everything from storytelling to rock engravings. Aboriginal constellations included and traced out lines connecting stars that we're all familiar with today, as well as dark constellations. Many different Aboriginal groups marked a giant emu sprawled across the Milky Way, a shape traced by dust lanes obscuring the centre of our galaxy that's only visible from the southern hemisphere. The Burong people have detailed oral records of an outburst from a star named Eta Carina. The star brightened dramatically in the 1830s and the 1840s and became one of the most brilliant stars in the sky, an event noticed by Burong astronomers and incorporated into their stories. 
In fact, Aboriginal astronomy observations were so detailed they even recognised that stars like Betelgeuse would slowly vary their brightness with time. Beginning in the 1780s, William and Caroline Herschel began to build a systematic catalogue of the northern sky for wide publication. The brother and sister team constructed telescopes together and used them from their home in England to painstakingly improve on past stellar catalogues, sweeping their telescopes methodically across the sky and making note of both known and newly discovered objects. The catalogue became an invaluable part of the scientific literature, listing objects, positions, sizes and brightnesses, and considered how they might be classified. Their observations also turned up numerous new objects. William discovered the planet Uranus, while Caroline discovered numerous comets. Her work was recognised with a gold medal from the Royal Astronomical Society, an honour that wouldn't be given to a woman again until Vera Rubin received it for her work on dark matter in 1996. The Herschel's final result, the new general catalogue, is still used today and many famous astronomical objects are identified by their NGC number. The Herschel's catalogue set an early standard for the best sky surveys of the day. A clear and well organised compendium of objects in the night sky, organised by position and listing key properties like brightness, shape and what each object might be. As a reference it proved crucial. An astronomer wandering about a strange object that appeared through their telescope could simply check the catalogue to see whether that object was previously known, a new discovery or represented some kind of surprising change. Another leap forward came with the National Geographic Society Palomore Observatory Sky Survey, which began in 1949. By then, astronomy had moved into the era of enormous mirrored telescopes, dedicated observatories on dark mountaintops, and top-quality glass photographic plates. All of this dramatically increased the potential of an all-sky survey. We have heard about Palomore earlier in these programmes. George Ellery Hale's immense 200-inch telescope also began its operations in 1949, dwarfing any other telescope in the world and vastly expanding astronomers' ability to see deep into the universe. We might expect that Palomar's huge detail survey of the northern sky would have been carried out with Palomar's biggest telescope. However, that wasn't the case. Instead, the survey was done using the observatory's relatively shrimpy 48-inch telescope. But why? To understand this, we need to go back to the rules governing the optics of telescopes. The 200-inch telescope had an enormous parabolic mirror, dramatically magnifying a seemingly small piece of the sky to capture the impossible faint light from distant objects. This meant that while the 200-inch was capable of achieving unprecedentedly detailed observations of the night sky, it could only do so on one tiny patch of sky at a time, thanks to its small field of view. This was a great telescope for depth and detail, but surveying the entire sky with it would have been like trying to cover the floor of a huge house with postage stamps. The 48-inch telescope, however, was specifically designed to capture wide fields of view. Its mirrors were spherical, not parabolic, and the telescope used a corrective lens to sharpen some of the known blurring that could occur at the edges of an image taken with a spherical mirror. The mirror's smaller size and unusual shape meant that, while it wasn't as powerful as the 200-inch, it could capture much larger swathes of the sky in a single observation. Now, instead of postage stamps, astronomers had huge square tiles at their disposal, literally. The 48-inch telescope's survey data was stored on 14-inch square glass photographic plates, enormous for the time. 
Each plate stored a 6 degree square view of the sky, equivalent in size to fitting 144 full moons into one image. These plates, however, were fiddly and difficult to work with. The telescope focused images to a curved plane rather than a flat surface, so astronomers would have to pre-bend the thin and brittle glass plates so that they would fit into the curved slot of the telescope's camera. More than one operator who worked at Palomar would tell about a plate snapping in their hands or worse, hearing the crack of a plate inside the camera part way through an observation. The plates also had to be carefully stored, prepared and developed in darkness to avoid overexposing them and ruining a night of observations. However, the payoff was incredible. The Palomar Observatory Sky Survey observed the entire sky visible from their mountain top twice. Once with photographic plates that were most sensitive to red light and again with plates that were more sensitive in the blue. Combined, this meant that Palomar had assembled a complete view of the night sky in colour. It sounds simple, but knowing the colour of an object can make the world a difference, allowing an astronomer to separate cold stars from hot stars and young galaxies from old. The survey took nearly 10 years and 2,000 plates, but when it was finished it immediately became a treasure trove of references for astronomers. Now an observer who wanted to track down an unusual object they'd found during their work could simply reference a copy of the Palomar's plates using a coordinate grid and magnifying loop to successfully identify and examine what they had been studying. Astronomers at Palomar and elsewhere would scrutinise the plates taken from night to night and took great advantage of overlaps in the plates. From one night to the next, comparing two plates could alert them to a tiny moving object, maybe a new asteroid or passing comet, or the sudden appearance of a supernova. Data from the National Geographic Society Palomar Observation Sky Survey is still used today. The data were eventually digitised and an automated scanner generated a catalogue that listed the tens of millions of objects contained on the plates. Still, by the end of the 20th century, a group of astronomers was ready to take the next step. Jim Gunn is something of a living legend to modern day astronomers, a scientist who achieved a superhuman task of excelling in three different areas of research. As a theorist, the same kind of work Einstein was famous for, Gunn made groundbreaking strides in understanding the formation and evolution of galaxies. As an observer mastering the art of capturing data from the night sky like Vera Rubin, Gunn gathered exquisite heaps of data on distant galaxies and entire clusters of galaxies, putting his own theory to the test in the same way that Eddington tested Einstein's. Finally, Gunn was a brilliant instrumentalist, designing the telescopes and cameras that were used to study the cosmos. We've heard about past telescope and instrument builders like George Ellery Hale and George Carruthers, who designed the world's largest telescopes and groundbreaking new telescopes. Gunn has worked on the Hubble Space Telescope and on cameras designed to unravel the mysteries of dark matter and dark energy. Most astronomers spent a lifetime building the skill and expertise to excel in just one of these fields – theory, observations or instrumentation. Jim Gunn has made pioneering contributions to all of these. In 1987, Gunn described an idea for a digital telescope, taking advantage of the larger and more efficient CCD detectors that were beginning to supersede photographic plates. Short for charge couple devices, CCDs contained silicon chips that were far more sensitive to light than glass plates. Moreover, they could translate the light they received into a quantifiable digital signal. Used properly, an image from a CCD wouldn't just show that a star 
or galaxy was bright or dim, it would spit out numbers measuring that brightness. This technique opened up a whole new world of precision comparisons and computational data in astronomy, and Jim Gunn recognised early on that CCDs could be an invaluable tool for a new and immense undertaking, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey has its own dedicated telescope in New Mexico, with a 2.5 metre diameter mirror, twice the size of the Palomar Survey Telescope. Its field of view may have been slightly reduced by comparison, but it made up for the smaller footprint with sheer efficiency. The survey has observed almost continuously since the year 2000 and has built up a multicolour catalogue of nearly 1 billion objects. More incredibly, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey has also captured spectroscopic data from more than 4 million objects. Remember, imaging data represents a picture of the night sky often taken over a particular wavelength range to capture how much red or yellow or blue light an object is emitting. A spectrum, by comparison, captures the light from an object and then sorts it out according to wavelength, revealing exactly how much light an object is emitting at every wavelength. Spectroscopic data is immensely powerful. Annie Jump Cannon used it to classify stars, and astronomers like Edwin Hubble used it to study the expansion of the universe. So, if it's so much better, why don't we simply acquire the spectra of everything in the night sky? That question might sound absurd to many astronomers for one simple reason. Imaging in astronomy is fairly straightforward. You point a telescope at a patch of sky, take a picture and then see what you've got. The telescope must be pointed pretty carefully, but if you're a bit off to the left or right, you can usually still see what you're looking for. You can even take an image without knowing exactly what you're taking an image of. This is how many early survey observers, from William and Caroline Herschel to the Palomar astronomers, carried out their own methodical searches of the night sky, moving their telescopes from spot to spot and then examining the data to see what they had found. Spectroscopy poses a more daunting challenge. In spectroscopy, an astronomer must know exactly where the object of interest is because they need to centre on the object perfectly. The star or galaxy they're studying needs to be lined up with a narrow slit or an optical fibre to ensure that this object, and only this object, is sending its light into the spectrograph. Get the object's position wrong by even a tiny amount and you've missed the light completely. The spectrograph will instead be pointed at an empty or impossibly faint patch of sky, and the data will come back blank or useless. The Sloan survey solved this by using its own early images to design enormous observing plates, custom designed to match specific patches of sky. Each plate was covered in tiny holes that would perfectly line up with the exact positions of hundreds of individual stars or galaxies. Each hole would, in turn, be plugged into an optical fibre that fed the light from the star or galaxy to a specific position on an enormous CCD. With this design, the Sloan telescope could simply be loaded with a specific plate, plugged up with a forest of optical fibres and pointed to the exact spot in the sky that corresponded to that plate. Then, in a single exposure, this one telescope would observe hundreds and hundreds of spectra that could be stored digitally and studied by any curious astronomer. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey revolutionised the study of stars and galaxies, producing an incredible wealth of data. Like the Herschel's catalogue and the Palomar plates, astronomers still use Sloan data today. But unlike the Herschel catalogue from several centuries ago, the Sloan database is still growing as its telescope continues to pursue new and exciting scientific ideas that take advantage of its incredible digital observing capabilities. The Herschel catalogue is finished and the Sloan dataset continues to grow. 
As for the Palomar observations, well, now the 48-inch telescope at Palomar is working on something else. We've talked about surveys that catalogue objects that measure their brightness and colour, and even surveys that can observe those objects' spectra. But there's one more thing that we still need to study – time. Aboriginal astronomers recognise the brightness variations in stars like Betelgeuse. Caroline Herschel discovered a host of new comets. Henrietta Levitt recognised the regular variations present in Cepheid variables. Oscar Dunhoud appreciated the strangeness of a newly bright star that turned out to be a nearby supernova. All of these observations are part of a field that we know as time domain astronomy. Time domain astronomy is exactly what it sounds like, studying how things change in the sky with time. Spotting an occasional odd variable star or happening to catch the brief appearance of a comet is one way to approach time domain astronomy, but it depends a bit on luck. Like Caroline and Henrietta, you need to look in the right place at the right time. Or, like Oscar and the Aboriginal Boorong clan, you need to really know a part of the night sky by heart to recognise any changes. Surveys are an excellent way to transform time domain astronomy from lucky to methodical. Imagine a survey like Palomar or Sloan observing a vast array of stars not just once but over and over again. Over time, these data come to represent not just a picture of the night sky, but a movie, tracking every change or variation as a function of time. We've talked before in these programmes about light curves, plots that track how the brightness of an object change with time. A time domain survey builds up an incredible store of light curves, monitoring stars that could be Cepheids, or strange erupting stars like the Borang Zeta Carina. These stars could be orbited by other stars, or neutron stars, or even planets, and we'll see signs of all this in their light curves. These movies of the night sky can also alert us to sudden guest appearances. The asteroids and supernova that scientists used to search for while scrutinising the Palomar plates will simply leap out at us over a series of movie frames. Of course, we don't literally shoot movies of the night sky. Observing faint objects still takes long exposures, and the data from a telescope still needs to be carefully processed and analysed before we see the finished product. Still, a number of modern surveys are focused on capturing these time-dependent phenomena in the night sky. The 48-inch telescope at Palomar, once used for the observatory's first Great Sky Survey, has now been upgraded to operate robotically, complete with an automatic arm that can change the camera's filters for collecting different kinds of data, and observe the night sky over and over. NASA's TESS mission, short for Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, observes bright stars over and over again from orbit as quickly as once every 30 seconds to search for any changes in each star's light curve. The mission's primary goal is to spot planets around other stars, which we'll talk about in the third and final section of these programmes. Still, even stars that don't have planets are fascinating to study with TESS, revealing everything from tiny outbursts to strange seismic activity inside the stars themselves. In this second part of our programme, we've learned about our dynamic and energetic universe, from supernovae and gravitational waves to Einstein's theory of relativity and the evolving astronomy community. And one constant theme has been the importance of time. Imaging, spectroscopic and time domain astronomical surveys have been game changers for much of how we study astronomy. The next generation of survey telescopes, including an incredible new facility in Chile, will continue to carry this progress forward. We will learn more about that telescope and what it means for tomorrow's heroes of astronomy in the future. 
For now, we'll move into the third section of our programmes and begin exploring some astronomical questions that might seem surprisingly nearby. In our next programmes, we'll begin looking at our own astronomical backyard, our solar system. We'll cover the science of these places that are close to our own home and begin to peer outward at the homes we could one day find elsewhere in the universe. Well, it's time for me to take my leave. I hope you enjoyed this program and remember everybody please stay safe look after one another and I'll see you again next week bye for now